Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And welcome to the first physical meeting of the Norwegian Atlantic Committee in 19... No, 2022. <laughs> My name is Kate Hansen Bunt, and I'm the Secretary General of the Committee. It's wonderful to see so many people in person again, and to make this event even uh, safer and safe as possible, I will ask you to remain seated until the seminar is over at 11 o'clock. And to those who follow us on online, good morning to you. You are, of course, as welcome as those sitting in the House of Literature in Oslo. I thank you for joining us virtually. A special warm welcome goes to our two main speakers this morning, NATO's Deputy Secretary General, Mirshua Dioana, and our Norwegian Minister of Defence, Odd Roger Enoksen. Thank you for taking time in a busy schedule to be with us this morning. I would also like to welcome our three panelists who will take part in the discussion today after the two introductions made by the Minister and NATO's Deputy Secretary General. We have with us a lawyer and social scientist at the Norwegian Academy of International Law, Dr. Cecilia Hellestreit, Senior Research Fellow at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, Dr. Karsten Fries, and journalist and commentator, particularly on security and defense policy in our daily newspaper, Dagens Nangsliv, Sverre Strandhagen. We are looking forward to listening to you in a moment. Today's event is titled NATO at a Crossroad. Our main topic will be the current tense situation in Europe, both between Russia and Ukraine, due to the Russian military buildup along Ukraine's borders, and between Russia and NATO after Moscow's demands on NATO to close its open door policy and withdraw its military forces from NATO allies joining after 1997. The standoff with Russia over Ukraine seems to be at a critical point today. Emmanuel Macron is traveling to Moscow in this very moment, meeting with Vladimir Putin to try to find a diplomatic solution. On the other side of the globe, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor is traveling to meet US President Joe Biden, uh, also to try to negotiate and find some kind of diplomatic solution to this uh, situation. But at the same time, there is an ongoing process within the Alliance to develop a new strategic concept that is set to lay the path forward for NATO in the coming decade. The concept will be adopted at the NATO summit in Madrid, end of June, and we are looking forward to discuss what will be the most important issues on the way to Madrid and beyond. Thus, it looks like the Alliance has a tremendous challenge in front of it, and we are eager to hear NATO's Deputy Secretary General comments on the current situation. Let me shortly introduce Mr. Adjona to you. He was appointed NATO Deputy Secretary General for mid-October 2019, the first DSG from any of the countries that joined the alliance after the Cold War. He has a distinguished domestic and international career behind him. He is the founder and president of the Aspen Institute of Romania, he previously served as the president of the Romanian Senate. He was foreign minister and Romania's ambassador to the United States. Please, Mr. Giona, the floor is yours. Come and take the podium. Um, thank you, Kate, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, uh, Minister Enoksen, uh, Ambassador Bu, uh, Ambassadors, 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, in Oslo, in this distinguished uh, place, to discuss uh, the current crisis in Ukraine and the future of our NATO alliance. I would like to thank the Norwegian Atlantic Committee for organizing today's seminar, and Minister Enriksen Odd for Norway's support at this time of increased political tensions from our highly valued ally, Norway. Norway is indeed an essential member of NATO. It is one of the 12 original allies. It's our most northerly ally. It has a long history of dealing peacefully with its powerful neighbor to the east, to deal with many complex diplomatic and political issues worldwide. And uh, I believe it holds a special place at the heart of our current Secretary General, and I'll not get into details about, about Jens. Over the next few months, Norway will host two major exercises designed to increase the readiness of NATO forces. Some 35,000 troops from 26 nations, allies, and partners, like Finland and Sweden, will take part in exercise called response. I know the minister will speak more about this. But let me tell you from a NATO perspective, this exercise will be the largest Norwegian-led exercise since the 1980s. It will simulate an Article 5 scenario where allies come to Norway's aid following an attempted invasion. Two of NATO's carrier groups will take part. The United Kingdom's new Her Majesty's Prince of Wales and the United States' USS Harry S. Truman. By the way, Harry S. Truman is today under, under NATO command in the Adriatic for the first time since the Cold War. This, this will be a considerable demonstration of NATO's unity and readiness to defend all allies. At the same time, exercise Brilliant Jump will test and train NATO's very high readiness joint task force, its spearhead force, and its ability to deploy rapidly to an allied country. While both these exercises were long planned, they are especially timely as they come at a critical moment in Euro-Atlantic security. Russia has deployed more than 100,000 troops, combat-ready troops, in and around Ukraine. They have advanced weapons, including jet aircraft, tanks, missiles, and S-400 air defense system. And there are now significant deployments in Belarus under cover of a joint exercise. So NATO allies have been clear and united in our response. We call on Russia to immediately de-escalate the situation. We firmly believe that dialogue and diplomacy, and Kate referred to some of the today's diplomat diplomatic efforts that we fully encourage. Dialogue and diplomacy are the best way to resolve our disagreements, not force or the threat of force. At the end of last month, and in parallel with the United States, NATO has submitted its written proposals to Russia. We see room for progress in three main areas. First, NATO-Russia relations. Dialogue between NATO and Russia has become more difficult since Russia cut diplomatic ties with NATO. So we propose, in a written form, re-establishing our respective offices in Moscow and Brussels. We should make full use of our existing mill-to-mill -mill channels of communications to promote transparency and reduce risks. And we should look into setting up civilian hotline for emergencies between Moscow and Brussels. The second area is European security, including, of course, the situation in and around Ukraine. Russia is directly attempting to bolster its own security at the expense of other states. It will stop its coercive force posturing, its aggressive rhetoric, and its malign activities directed against allies and other nations. It should withdraw the forces from Ukraine, from Georgia, from Moldova, which are deplo deployed without this country's consent, thus violating their sovereignty. And all parties should engage constructively in efforts to settle conflicts peacefully, including in the Normandy format. NATO allies are prepared to listen to Russia's concerns. And yes, we are ready to engage in a real conversation on how to uphold and strengthen the fundamental principles of European security. 
We have all signed up to these principles in a range of agreements, starting with the Helsinki Final Act. Those principles include the right of self-determination, that each sovereign nation can choose its own path, including its own security arrangements. NATO respects those countries that decide to apply for NATO membership, as Georgia and Ukraine have done. NATO also respects other countries that do not apply for NATO membership, like Norway's neighbors, Finland and Sweden, and other countries in the OSE space that have chosen different security arrangements, including inside the CSTO. Then, if a nation does apply to be a member to NATO, it's up to the 30 allies to decide by consensus whether they can join or not. This is a fundamental principle of NATO and of European security. And upon this, we will not compromise. The third area where we see room for progress with Russia is in risk reduction, transparency, and arms control. Such practical measures have long made a real difference to European and global security. And we have shown that we can make progress with Russia on this in the past. And this was and should continue to be for our mutual benefit. So as a first step, we are proposing mutual briefings on exercises and nuclear policies in the NATO-Russia Council. We should also modernize the Vienna document on military transparency and work to reduce space and cyber threats. We should consult on ways to prevent incidents in the air and at sea and recommit to full compliance with international commitments on chemical and biological weapons. Finally, we need to have a serious conversation on arms control, including new nuclear weapons and ground-based intermediate and shorter range missiles. Together, these represent an agenda for meaningful dialogue. The Secretary General has invited allies and Russia to further meetings of the NATO-Russia Council. You know that we had the first one after two and a half years of long pause just a few weeks ago. So future NATO-Russia councils should address these issues in greater detail. We are ready to meet with the Russian side as soon as possible. NATO is a defensive alliance. We do not see confrontation with Russia or with any other country. But we cannot and will not compromise on the principles on which our security rests. We'll take all necessary measures to defend and protect all allies. From Oslo, I will be going tomorrow to Vilnius to be part of the anniversary of the fifth anniversary of the NATO battle group in that country where service women and servicemen from, from your great nation are serving together with other allies. In recent years, NATO has adapted to a rapidly deteriorating security environment, not only to a more assertive Russia, but to the rise of terrorist groups like ISIL and other challenges such as the rise of China, disruptive technologies, nuclear proliferation, and yes, the threat of climate change. We have responded with one with the biggest strengthening of our collective defense in a generation, but we, we do and we will do more. Key areas for further adaptation, including continuing to strengthen our militaries and increase our readiness. Strengthening our societies to make them more resilient to malicious acts, because societal resilience is our first line of defense. We have to defend against cyber attacks, against disinformation campaigns, of meddling with our politics and our democratic processes, working even more closely with our partners around the world. NATO has more than 40 individual partnerships around the world. We have partnerships with the important international organizations like the EU or the UN, with the OSCE, with the OECD more recently, with the African Union. We'll engage with partners from all over the world. And of course, we have to make sure that uh, working together to tackle challenges like terrorism or climate change is paramount. But of course, the fundamental investment will be for NATO to remain the institutional link between Europe and North America. And this crisis in around Ukraine, fomented by Russia, is an indicator of the uniqueness and the indispensable role of our alliance in European and world affairs. 
We do this to protect the one billion people living in the 30 ally nations, to defend our nations, to defend our people, to defend the international rule-based order. And yes, something which is the foundation of our alliance to defend our values, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Kate mentioned that our next summit in late June in Madrid, our leaders will agree a new strategic concept. Next to the Washington Treaty, this is the most important document in NATO. The concept will provide a collective assessment of the current security environment and reaffirm our values, our purpose, and our tasks. As such, it will drive the strategic adaptation of the Alliance for the decade to come. So that's a fundamental strategic document for NATO. Secretary General Stoltenberg has and continues to consult extensively amongst allies, members of national parliaments, expert groups like yourselves, youth, civil society, and of course the private sector. We're also engaging with partner countries and international organizations such as the European Union, mutually briefing each other on the strategic compass that the EU is embarked in adopting relatively soon, and of course on our strategic concept, making sure that we keep them aligned, cohesive and synergistic. So the next strategic concept and NATO's further adaptation will prepare NATO for the challenges we face today and in the years ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, our free societies are under greater pressure now than any time since the Cold War. There is a very real risk of war in Europe. The threat of terrorism persists, and we face many other challenges, from disruptive technologies to cyber attacks and to the security implications of climate change. Our future is uncertain, so we need a strategy for dealing with that uncertainty. Fortunately, we have one certitude, and this is NATO. By strengthening our alliance and by using it to its fullest extent, we will continue to maintain security, prosperity, and freedom for many generations to come and to contribute to a world based on rules, norms, and predictability in international affairs. That was NATO is. And at the 72nd anniversary of our alliance, we are more energetic and more ready to embrace the future like we have so successfully done with the first allies, including Norway, 72 years ago, will do our job also in the future. So thank you so much for having me, and we appreciate and applaud our Norwegian allies, steadfast members of our alliance. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, those uh, words. We will be able to discuss it uh, further in a moment. Uh, you said, uh, Deputy Secretary General, that it's a real threat of war in Europe. That's uh, rather, um, how does this look from Norway? What's Norway's responses and what do you uh, make out of this uh, Minister of Defense. Uh, we are very eager to hear how you are discussing this at the very moment. Um, let me introduce our Minister of Defense also to those who are with us uh, around in Europe on our stream. Most of those sitting here in the House of Literature knows him. Uh, Odd Roger Enoksen took seat as Norway's new Minister of Defence in October last year on behalf of the Centre Party. He has a long career holding different positions in this party, both as a former party leader, as a parliamentary leader, and as Minister of Petroleum and Energy, to mention a few. In 2005, he left politics and became CEO of Anoya Space Center, where he worked until we got him here back to Oslo and he returned to politics as a Minister of Defense last October. Please, uh, Odrogi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kate. Um, Dear Deputy uh, Secretary General Mircea, welcome to Norway, the northern flank of uh, NATO. 
And uh, thank you also, Kate, the panel, and the participants. Um, let, me, let me start by addressing the near future. The situation in Europe has not been as tense since the Cold War. The Russian military buildup around Ukraine and the demands to the US and NATO uh, represents a shift in the security conditions in Europe. This affects Norway as well. We follow the situation closely with great concern and in close contact with our allies. Peace and security cannot be taken for granted. The ongoing large-scale Russian military buildup is a stark reminder of that. Placing 100,000 Russian soldiers on Ukraine's border is not an acceptable way of performing dip diplomacy. It is not acceptable when large states try to limit small states' ability to act as free democracies. Norway has always supported strong multilateral organizations and a rule-based world order. Every country has the right to choose its security alignment. As a small democracy, we understand the concerns of our Nordic non-aligned neighbors. They are not actively seeking membership of NATO, but want to determine this themselves. Let me be clear. Russia is responsible for the increased tension close to the Ukrainian borders. It is up to Russia to reduce the tension by withdrawing its forces. Russia's attempts to block future NATO expansion and its cooperation with Ukraine are unacceptable and they are not in line with international rule of law. To de-escalate the situation, it is important to use uh, established international mechanisms. NATO should be the main arena for coordinating a Western response towards Russia. The alliance has uh, shown cohesion in this critical situation, and both the US and NATO have signaled a willingness for further dialogue. Norway follows the situation in the high north closely, as we have done for a long time. We contribute to the alliance with situational awareness, presence and stability. From Norway, the conflict in Ukraine can seem far away. At the same time, Russian military modernization um, and activity have been very visible in our areas for over the last years. I'm referring to Russian strategic signaling of Orwell uh, show of force in areas close to Norway. Russian maritime forces have a high level of activity in the high north, including tests on new advanced weapon systems. We, we expect this to continue. The increasing number of uh, advanced submarines and the expected deployment of hypersonic anti-ship missiles, missiles present an increasing challenge. Our key concern is Russia's increasing ability to reduce NATO's freedom of movement and to disrupt transatlantic sea lines of communication. This is a strategic challenge to Allied security and it is of concern to the whole, all, whole of Europe. Russia's military exercise support last year demonstrated how Russia incre uh, continues to increase its military capabilities. We observed extensive maritime, maritime activity in the high north and a considerable build-up of forces on the Kola Peninsula. In 2017, we witnessed a transfer of forces to the peninsula on a scale we have not seen before. With this, Russia demonstrated ability to move large forces rapidly and over a great distance. This means that warning times have been significantly reduced. The deteriorating security situation has been ongoing for several years, but I would describe the situation we are in now as more severe than in long time. For Norway, this means that we need to continue building a strong national defense. At the same time, NATO remains the cornerstone of Norwegian security. A strong NATO is more important than ever. The ability to respond to a crisis is all about having the right forces and in the right place at the right time. We need a well-functioning NATO command structure, an adapted force structure, and updated contingency plans. 
the implementation of the deterrence and defense concept for the European for the Euro-Atlantic Alliance is important and we will continue our contribution to the military adaptation of the alliance. Uh, adaptation of the alliance. In March this year, Norway will host uh, exercise called response, as we have already heard. We expect about 30,000 Norwegian and Allied soldiers to take place in the exercise. We have a long tradition of hosting major allied, uh, allied and multinational military exercises in a demanding Arctic environment. We look forward to welcoming our allies and partners for what will be the main exercise activity for many nations this year. The exercise will have a challenging scenario. It will test allied forces' ability to reinforce Norway and our own ability to receive these reinforcements. An essential part of the exercise is to test and validate, validate allied and national defense plans. Let me make a um, last few points on the long-term security of the alliance. The new strategic concept, which is to be decided in Madrid in June, will have an important bearing on NATO's priorities in the future. Our defense of key principles, such as support of democratic values and a rule-based international order, must be in the forefront. The latest development in Europe have clearly shown that it is more important than ever that we strengthen our deterrence and defense posture. This will be a Norwegian priority as we approach the NATO summit. We have made many important decisions in the Alliance over the past years. This has strengthened our ability to collectively defend our member states. We also need strong solutions for common funding and the ambitions in the Defence Investment Pledge is as important as ever. This leads me to my final point. When we talk about our security environment, an integral part is how emerging and disruptive technologies influence this environment. New technologies in the hands of our adversaries could render current defense investments obsolete or less effective. On the other hand, innovative use of new technologies in the Alliance will give us an advantage. Norway will continue to invest in research and development so that we have a continued technological edge within the Alliance. In that regard, we welcome NATO's Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, Diana. We are currently exploring the possibility of contributing to this initiative as well as to the NATO Innovation Fund. We must also look closely into the consequences of new threats cyber threats, hybrid threats, and the ongoing space race extend, extend the range of threats we currently face. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to hearing from the panelists and you in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you can... Yeah. I would like to invite the panelists and the Deputy Secretary General up to the stage. Uh, maybe you can step another seat <laughs> so I can sit here. And uh, the Secretary, yeah, there. And I think it has something to do with the microphones. They are sat on these seats. Thank you. And thank you very much for your uh, interesting introductions. Um, I thought that we should uh, do it this way, that we speak a little bit about the current uh, tense security situation, and then um, go over to uh, the NATO strategic concept process and uh, preparing for Madrid after a while, but I've asked my commentators, the panelists, to give a first comment on what has been said from the podium. So I will invite uh, Kirsten Fries first, please. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and, and thank you both for your very good speeches. And good to see everybody here. And to those of you who are watching us, it's, it's great to be back on a panel. Let me, as an academic, maybe take a little bit step back and try to reflect on this strange situation we're in. Because it's, it's, it's sad, it's a bit depressing. And, and it's a kind of a crisis that came out of the blue because nobody wanted this. And, and it's no trigger, nothing has happened that kind of legitimizes this Russian buildup. So it's like, so this brings me to two questions. What's at stake and why now? Um, as Mr. Enoxen said, uh, we are talking about the rules-based international order. That's what's at stake here. It is very serious. Um, but from the Russian side, we are told that there's been a buildup of frustration for a long time. It's been brewing for years, kind of a Western arrogancy, maybe. Uh, we've been told that NATO enlargement has kind of encroached Russia and, and increased uh, the threat for Russia. Uh, we've been taught about this, this concept, indivisible security, that one security shouldn't be at the expense of the other one. Now, uh, if you look at the NATO enlargement, though, I mean, to what extent we encroached? It's only actually two of the new NATO states that have land border with Russia proper. That's Estonia and Lithuania, Latvia. If you include uh, the Kaliningrad, you can add Poland and Lithuania. Uh, so it's not like there's a lot of new borders around, around Russia than used to be before. And Norway, of course, is a third country. Has there been a military buildup of the last years from the Western side in Europe? Well, in 1990, the United States had 300,000 troops in Europe. Now it's about 70,000 or something like that. Maybe the Deputy Secretary General can correct the number, but there's something along those lines. If you look at European forces, I mean, if you look at just like the main, the main European states, the six biggest ones, how many tanks do we have? It's been reduced by 85% of this period. Just since 2010, we went down from about 4,000 tanks among the six biggest European countries, except the United States, to, to a little bit more than 1,000 right now, last 10 years. And this goes on, as you know, military expense, uh, depend, uh, spending has gone down quite a lot in Europe until 2014, where the pendulum swung a little bit because of Russia, right? And then we have all talked about reaching 2% again and getting back on a little bit, but we're not really there yet, so to speak. Um, it's quite a while to go. Um, so there is no increased military threat. And as Mr. Jonas said, uh, NATO is willing to talk about whatever we have with forces, including new weapon system like, like, like uh, intermediate missiles and other things. So, so, and then you've seen the, the response from NATO and United States in El Pai, if you haven't, you can see it there. It's been leaked, and in very detail, what is on the table, what's being suggested to talk about. Okay, why now? Well, the last time NATO enlarged into former uh, Warsaw Pact country was in 2004. It's like 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and so this is nothing new that this enlargement happened. And of course, it's Ukraine which is being talked about, but, but let's be frank, uh, Ukraine is not much closer to NATO membership now than it was in 2008. If it is closer, it's because the population is much, much more str strongly oriented towards the West because of pressure from Russia. So it's not kind of created by, by the West at all. So I can speculate why it's happening now, maybe it's domestic reasons, maybe it's you know, other reasons uh, for Putin, Kremlin's regime, need to do this, I will not, I'm not speculate on this. But the bottom line is that, objectively speaking, so to speak, uh, there is no urgency. There should be time to negotiate and talk and address the real concerns that might be there. And I really hope that uh, this call uh, takes over, that diplomacy will, will make tensions go down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karsten, for these first uh, introductory remarks. I will go to Cecilia. You have for many years been following Russia's actions in the Middle East. And you argue uh, to a certain extent, uh, extent that uh, Putin's offensive in Ukraine and Moscow's bold position on Europe must be seen in a broader perspective. Also what Russia is doing in the Middle East. Could you comment a little bit on that? Yes, thank you very much, Kate, for inviting me. And thank you to the Deputy, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary General and the F Minister of Foreign Affairs for their interventions. I have been following uh, Russia's military and diplomatic engagements to the South uh, for the past decade. And 
I, I'm going to adopt a somewhat different perspective from Karsten, mm. because I do not see this as very surprising in terms of the moment that Putin has chosen for the escalation in and around Ukraine. I am also not surprised at the modus, the way that Putin has ex escalated the situation. Now, first of all, I believe, uh, as Macron said when he was leaving for Moscow, that Putin's uh, escalation is clearly not only about Ukraine, but it is about clarifying the rules of cohabitation between NATO and Russia, and between Russia and the European Union. Because I believe that the timing of the escalation in November has to do with three processes. Now, the first is the one that uh, is going on in NATO, the second, the one that is going on in Brussels with Europe and Europe's strategic compass. And I think that the third is the leverage that Russia has developed and that Putin has obtained in the southern regions of Russia over the past 10, but particularly five years. Mm -hmm. Russia is in a very strong position now compared to what it has been historically when it comes to Iran, when it comes to Afghanistan, when it comes to, to some extent, Turkey and Turkey's position to the south. I believe that Putin is using his his positions to the south in order to influence the processes going on in NATO and in the EU uh, this spring, because this is when you are forging the new models that will influence security in Europe for the next decade to come. Uh, I also believe that Putin is gambling. It's a high gamble, and there is a real risk of war. I do, however, believe that Putin believes that he can pull this off. Uh, by securing Russia either to the west in a way that is, you know, that will, that will uh, cater to his interests, or that in case it crumbles, he will be able to secure his interests to the south, in the Caspian Sea with Iran uh, and uh, with a way of, um, let's say, using his position in some of the processes surrounding Syria, surrounding Iran, and surrounding Afghanistan to cater to his needs. So I believe that there is a, there is a, uh, a reason for Putin's acts. There is a reason for why he's doing it now. And he, I do believe that he's trying to sow as much uh, tension between the European continental NATO members and the non-continental mm. NATO members as possible. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, Svarja, do you see a Kremlin that is trying to divide and rule among both uh, between the US and Europe and uh, inside the European Union, which are some of the arguments made by Cecilia? Um, yes, thank you, Kate. And, um, Mr. Genoa and Mr. Enoxon, thank you for, for very interesting presentations. Um, well, first, I, I would say that um, the situation is, is very uh, grave. It's dangerous. I heard Mr. Jake Sullivan, the National Security, Security Advisor in, in the White House, um, in an interview yesterday that the invasion can happen today, Monday. Um, I don't know what's going on just now, but the point is that um, it can be an invasion in a few days. It can be no invasion. It can be a lot of cyber attacks. It can be a lot of subversion. Um, maybe the invasion will come next year. I don't know. But anyway, the situation is very, very dangerous. Um, there are two points I'd like to, to stress. Um, in the West, they are doing a lot of cost-benefit analysis, and, and many experts have uh, think it's it, it's impossible to understand why the Russia, uh, what Mr. Putin is wanting to go into Ukraine, because he's making a lot of trouble for himself. Um, <clears throat> but there is one point uh, uh, to look at the the kind of regime we are talking about. Uh, 
Russia is an autocracy. It's a personalist, what we call a personalist regime. It's, it's a regime where there is a lot of power concentrated in one person. Um, and of course, as we all know, there is a small circle of, of advisors or, or people that surround him. We know that there are, they have the same way of thinking. They, have, um, they are hawkish. They came from the security um, organizations or services or intelligence. And there is a, always a problem of group thinking. But in Kremlin, I think there is a really big problem of group thinking. Uh, there are some experts that say that um, the information this circle gets, it's, um, it's often very limited. Uh, it's always biased. It's also kind of self-censored information. It's all also very optimistic information. <laughs> the point is that, to put it simple, it means that Putin may underestimate the costs of an invasion. Um, uh, a second point is that uh, for, for a long time, many experts have said that, that uh, Putin is, is a kind of risk averse. He, he doesn't want to, to use force if it's been going to be costly. Um, at the same time, if you look at the, at the situation today, um, we know that Putin has been in power since 1999. He has experienced five American presidents. <laughs> he has uh, gained uh, self-confidence uh, in handling with Europe, in handling with the US. Um, he, he sees that US is very weak and divided. He sees that Europe is very divided and weak. And he himself feel, feels that Russia is, is has quite a strong economy. They have the oil, the gas as a weapon. And they have um, a modernized military. They have these new weapons. I think that he, he feels that he can do what he wants, almost. Um, these two factors combined uh, makes it <laughs> a very dangerous situation. Uh, and, and I think that it's very interesting to see how much weight the US and also NATO is putting on diplomacy. And that is, of course, very, very important because I think one, one point in this effort is to convince the Russians that they have nothing to gain with this. This is contraproductive in a way. Um, they will, if they go into Ukraine, um, well, he said that they, have, they want the kind of, uh, of spheres of influence, yes? But what if they do go into uh, Ukraine, what will happen? Well, they should know that uh, the NATO will put more forces in the Baltics, in Romania maybe. Uh, they know that maybe Finland and, and Sweden will be more eager to join NATO. <laughs> the things that will happen is just the opposite what what Mr. Putin I is uh, intending to do. Yeah. Mm. So um, diplomacy is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sverre. Um, I would like to return to um, Deputy Secretary General. You, you said a lot about the answers we have given to the Russian demands. And from the Western side, it looks like they are very constructive. Uh, we want to uh, um, put diplomacy in the forefront, and we are doing a lot of efforts. Uh, what more, if anything, can NATO and the U.S. do diplomatically towards Russia if they don't step down from their very tough uh, rhetoric and military pressure? Do we have anything more in our um, sleeves? <laughs> uh, thank you, all, all three of you, for that's very insightful. 
I will not comment on every uh, on every uh, let's say focus uh, that you put on our conversation. Let me say uh, three things. First, we really are giving diplomacy not only a chance but the chance. We mean it. We're not in the game of bluffing. We're not in the game of pretending. We are really willing to engage Russia constructively on things that do affect our common security. Of course, it has to be on reciprocity. If they speak about uh, missile defense systems in Romania and Poland, fine. We also should talk to them about the missile system that they are putting in, in many places close to, close to NATO's borders. They speak of uh, transparency. Yeah, we speak about transparency. Cold response, we invited Russian observers to attend and have a look to what we do. They have not responded yet. So what I'm, I'm just saying, we encourage uh, also bilateral efforts or Normandy format. I mentioned this in my speech. There are many bilateral issues that are going on. We encourage all that. So we are giving diplomacy a real chance. And we are waiting for an answer to a very solid counter proposition from our side. And we hope that this will be something that Russia will contemplate. We understand that this is into uh, the Kremlin's uh, final decision. And we're waiting for that, uh, for that answer to, to come. And NATO-Russia Council reconvene, uh, hopefully, multiple times. Mm. Having said that, and building on the uh, cost-benefit analysis. Uh, I would say that one of the uh, uh, almost automatic reflexes inside NATO was a sense of what I would call intense, impeccable unity within NATO. Mm. I do not know if this was something that was intended by Mr. Putin. He was trying to make NATO stronger. If he was trying to make NATO even more relevant, I don't know. I'm ironical now. Um, but I, I, I also believe that we are showing an impeccable sense of unity. And of course, it's not, we have 30 NATO allies, various geographies, various historical backgrounds, various strategic cultures, various economic interests. And despite of all that, we have and we are more united than ever. And that's, that's a huge thing. Mm. And probably this is, together with diplomacy, the strongest deterrence that we can, we can have uh, in front of this, uh, of this, of this issue. Uh, energy security, that's a big issue. I'm not speculating on the reasons why. We have an idea why now and, and why in this format, very aggressive format, we have the Romanian ambassador here, Mr. Badescu, who was in his previous job before coming here to, to serve in Oslo, the energy uh, security czar in the government of Romania. So there is probably a calculation about the high prices now and the fact that energy transition will basically reduce, relatively speaking, uh, the, uh, the huge dependency of some European nations on, on Russian gas and, and natural resources. But let me put uh, an, an issue that is a little bit more strategic than this. Well, like it or not, we have re-entered the era of great power competition with everything which it tells. Mm. And this is a reality. Secondly, we are entering an era of structural and systemic shocks to come, not only from traditional military and defense-related risks, but also from other things. Pandemic is one example. Technology and the implications of the revolution on technologies is another example. Cyber, hybrid, the huge competition in space, which is only at the beginning. So we are now, basically, speaking of the unity of Europe and North America, and also the like-minded nations from all over the world. And I believe that the attempt by Russia now, possibly also by China, is to basically contest 
the system of international norms that have been adopted by us some seven decades ago, some 30 years ago since the Cold War finished with our triumph. And I think this is the strategic canvas that we have to see how things would evolve. There's nothing more important than our unity now. I would say this emphatically over and over again. And I know there are nuances and comments also in the media that some allies are more like this or more like that. Uh, Ambassador uh, Burke can, can testify around the NATO table, we see impeccable unity. And this is something that probably is the, the unintended consequences of Mr. Putin's aggressiveness. <laughs> I would like to continue on that one because um, watching uh, NATO's Secretary General Stoltenberg in his uh, speech in ACUS uh, last week, he said it is divide, di dividing lines inside the alliance, not on how to react on NATO allies, uh, if something should happen to those that are uh, inside NATO. But it is different opinions towards what's happening in Ukraine and how to react. As the Germans sending 5,000 helmets and Norway uh, minister uh, is also saying they will not uh, not sell true. weapons or provide Ukrainians with defensive weapons. And this is a cleavage inside uh, NATO at the moment because the UK and also United States are providing the Ukrainians with weapons. Mm -hmm. I would like to hear your reasoning behind the Norwegian position. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me first of all say that Norway is fully in line with what NATO is, is doing and the US positions. Di diplomacy is the way forward and the only way yep. forward. And, and I think quite opposite to what Putin has tried to, to, uh, to do, he has brought Ukraine closer to the West and not further away from the West. He has also brought Finland and Sweden closer to NATO, so quite opposite to what the, his intention has has been or should be. Um, so um, it's, it's a strange situation. Um, Norway is fully behind NATO. We have forces in Lithuania. We uh, are also willing to, of course, to increase our forces if needed within NATO. Uh, but it is our politics not to sell weapons or to supply with weapons. We have limited uh, possibilities to do so as well. And, of course, not either to have forces in, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. That's not a part of what we are doing. We are strictly staying to the diplomatic way forward. Um, and um, I, I, I do not think you see any differences in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in what the member states of NATO is trying to do. It is diplomacy. But, of course, there are different ways to support Ukraine, and that is part of what every country has to decide by themselves. And this is our decision. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Can, can, can I, because you, yes. you, you alluded, Kate, to the idea that there are privileges inside NATO. They're not. Because what NATO has decided by consensus, that's a democratic organization, every country has the right to, to, to speak up and mm. vote. We've decided to, to help Ukraine, uh, short of military uh, lethal operations, because that would be a sign of escalation on, on our side that we do not want to give. Of course, Ukraine is not a NATO member, thus Article 5 does not apply to them. That's the easy answer. But we are sending our cyber teams, our hybrid teams, our disinformation teams. Mm. We are helping in, in, in terms of training in command and control. So we are doing things at NATO for Ukraine, which is quite a bit. Mm. Some NATO allies that have their national policy, which we fully respect, not to lend to, to Ukraine lethal uh, weapons. Some allies do, some others don't. But this doesn't mean that speaking of European Union, we are now, we are in NATO, is not our business. But the EU has done something very important with the financial support from EU member states, which is 
a macroeconomic financial assistance package for Kiev. Mm. Because this very, and probably one of the intentions of Mr. Putin, if he decides or not decides to, to, to invade, we don't know. But pressure on Ukraine means also economic duress, mm. unhappiness mm. of the public, thus destabilization of regime becoming easier. It's obvious. But this is something that allies have done, sometimes under the EU umbrella, sometimes bilaterally. Our Canadian allies uh, uh, have increased dramatically their training capacity for the Ukrainian military forces, short of lethal. So please look at the entire ecosystem of NATO allies, and you'll see there is unity there. I don't say division of labor, per se. But together, we stand united. This is something I can say from within. Mm. And we have no issues about uh, you know, one, one ally doing uh, you know, this or that. Together, we are very much united, including in, in giving assistance to the eastern flank countries. The defense ministers, and we will welcome the minister for a very important defense ministerial meeting in NATO next week. There will be decisions, but our defense ministers, 30 allies, mm. by consensus, if and how should we strengthen the posture on the eastern flank? In the Baltic region, in the Black Sea region, you see France offering to be the framework nation uh, for an eventual battle group in my home country of Romania. So everything is, is sort of a, yep. a more interesting uh, yep. perspective. And, 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 and I think I also have to add that we, we should remember that the most important thing Norway is doing is uh, situational awareness in the high north and what we are doing in the north. Because even if we do not see any kind of escalation, a, 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 a more dramatic situation in the Ukraine can escalate and, and we need to pay attention to what is happening up in the high north and that is Norway's most important contribution also in this situation. Because I guess what we all are anxious for is some kind of spillover from the Ukraine situation to the whole region. I would like to go back to you, Karsten. You also asked for a comment, but I would like to ask you as a researcher, uh, how can Putin actually avoid not to attack Ukraine? After such a long time of tough military buildup and very tough rhetoric, and if diplomacy fails, how would a Russian attack on Ukraine look like? Okay, thank you. Um, just to make my comment on the previous discussion, I think it's sometimes a bit confusing because on the one hand we talk about European security architecture, uh, and NATO is united on that one, and, and NATO has a responsibility and can, can reinforce its, its allies. The other discussion is about Ukraine, uh, which is a little bit not exactly the same. Uh, and we don't know yet really what, what's at most concern in Kremlin, if it's Ukraine or, or the larger picture. And of course, when it comes to Ukraine, you have the Normandy negotiations, maybe starting again, maybe not. Um, and we have all these other, uh, let's say, players like European Union who play an important role and also bilateral you know, economic works and stuff. So I think it's a bit confusing sometimes these debates because, uh, because they're a little bit different, uh, these, two, these two aspects. Um, to your questions, if, can, can he step down? Yes, of course he can. I mean, there are only exercises. They have said many times they will not attack. So it's, it shouldn't be difficult to, to make a narrative about exercise being finalized over. Um, so so that, that's doable. If there was to be an attack, I mean, there are many theories. Uh, you know, military people tend to start to look at, okay, can we make a land, land line between, between Crimea and, and East? And, the, and expand the Donbass. I, I don't see that very... For me, that's like, what's the point with that? It's just extremely risky, and you just achieve the same you have today, which is basically harassing Ukraine. The only kind of, from a kind of, you know, Clausewitzian uh, war is continuation of politics, right? It's the only rational would be to take down Kiev and take the regime. Just a horrible take down the government, in, put in the regime, sorry. <laughs> uh, a kind of quisling regime. That's a horrible, expensive, you know, crazy idea, but from a kind of political point of view, what, what else is there? So, so that's what concerns me. That's, if you want to do that, you can roll in from, from, from the north, from, from uh, Belarus and from, and from uh, Russia. Uh, and they can do that, of course. It's, it's going to be a 
a horrible war, uh, and I don't want to think about the details, but I don't see, for me, that's the most likely, but also most scary scenario, because uh, the consequences will be terrible. Cecilia? Picking up on this issue on the consequences of a possible war in Ukraine, I think that is perhaps the main leverage of Putin in this moment because he's really playing into mm. the German fear of war in Europe. Among the continental uh, countries in Europe, Germany will really pay a price for this. Now, on the other hand, I believe that France is very worried about the French traditional interests and how they will fear uh, going forward into the NATO strategic concept because France is really seeking a kind of, not cooperation, but non-confrontation with Russia when it comes to the southern flank of Europe. What is happening in Africa, in Northern Africa and in the Middle East, mm. including in Iran, has a lot of effects for European security. This does not involve Great Britain. It does not involve the US. They have different, let's say, uh, priorities compared to the continental European countries. And I think that that is precisely where this uh, unity in NATO is being challenged by Putin's uh, acts. And I think that what he has been doing over the past three, four months is a, a way of having that conversation directly and indirectly, particularly with the European countries. Mm. What do you believe that the relationship between continental Europe and Russia should be going forward into uh, a rivalry between the US and China? What should continental Europe look like going forward? Mm. Thank you. Uh, Svadia, you asked for uh, a comment? Just a, a short comment on what um, if Putin is... Um, is uh, taking his forces back. Uh, uh, um, is he bluffing? Um, well, he has been with his 130,000 soldiers on the borders of Ukraine for so many months now that if he just says, well, we, we don't, this is a kind of exercise we will we'll stop, mm. I think he gets a, gets a problem. He gets a problem at home. Um, and everybody will look at him and say he is, uh, he is a loser. Um, so the, the, the dilemma now is that I think um, to avoid war, um, he ha NATO and US has to help him out. They have to give him something. Um, not much, but something. And of course, he can, he can, if he gets something, he can manipulate and, and use his propaganda apparatus at home to, to make it much bigger. Um, so I think that is, 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 is the big question now, how to help him out. Thank you, Svadja. Uh, you asked for a comment? Yeah, just a comment to yeah. that. Uh, the, the problem here is that the most important thing for Putin is seems to be to avoid Ukraine to be a member of NATO, and that is a guarantee NATO never can give, uh, because it will affect also others. Mm. Um, so I think that is the most challenging thing in, 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 in this uh, situation also for NATO, because NATO and the US have to give something, that's for sure. But the most important thing for Putin, I guess, can't be given. Thank you. Uh, time is running fast uh, when you have interesting uh, conversations. We will also open for questions from the audience, but I would like to make a bridge over to the strategic concept. And when I was watching the opening of the Olympic, I was reading in Guardian that Xi Jinping and Putin had met. They came with a joint statement. Uh, where uh, the Chinese was backing Putin's uh, questions to the West of a security guarantee. He was backing that NATO should close its open door policy. And also that we should withdraw uh, to the borders of 1997. Um, how will, how is this to a certain extent, affecting the process with a strategic concept as well. How will be the wording uh, on Russia and China 
in the new concept. In the old one, 10 years ago, we was talking about Russia as a strategic partner. I guess it will be different today. And how do you regard, Diana, uh, the Chinese-Russian track uh, in the current situation and how will we treat them in the strategic concept? Oh, the 2010 strategic concept, uh, which is B to be placed in Madrid at the summit with a new one, uh, was not only having President Medvedev of that time participating in the Lisbon NATO summit, imagine that, the Russian president at the NATO summit, uh, or <laughs> yeah. doing joint exercises. So, also in the current concept, there is no reference, none, on China, nothing. There are many other topics of interest to NATO and to all of us as citizens, to Norwegians, to Romanians, to Americans, to Canadians, to citizens of the world. Uh, things like uh, climate change and security. And we appreciate Norway's permanent input, always wise, always pertinent, uh, always non-provocative, in making sure that we anticipate the changes that climate change will bring in the North and in the South. This would be tremendous transformation of world affairs and geopolitics. Uh, there was resilience in the current concept was uh, uh, mentioned under the Article 3 of the Washington Treaty. There is a, a reference to resilient societies over there, but it's not what we are deciding now. Societal resilience, that's massively different. Mm. Massively different. And we are building upon the uh, the experience that Nordic countries, including here, including in Finland, NATO and non-NATO countries, on their uh, you know, total defense, societal resilience, and these issues together. So what I'm just trying to say that as we are, all of us concerned, uh, and trying to basically encourage Russia to, to, to return to diplomatic and political solutions to, to the issues that they are provoking, we are not losing sight of the fact that NATO is in the business of having 360 degrees security to all of us, from the south, from the north, everywhere. From any geography, from any domain, and NATO has now five operational domains, which are the traditional three ones, land, sea, and air, but also we have cyber since 2016, operational domain. And our friends in uniform uh, and the professionals on cyber know what this means. Also space is the fifth and the newest kid in town. We didn't speak of emerging disruptive technologies in the current concept. Only in London in 2019, our leaders decided and, in, and, in, and, and basically instructed NATO, and we do this. I'm chairing the innovation board of NATO on behalf of the SecGen to see which is the impact of new technologies, quantum and cybersecurity, this is coming. Space, new missile systems, uh, biotechnology, human enhancement. Uh, I'm not speaking of AI and, and big data because we have adopted already in uh, NATO a policy on AI, which is also for the first time a big international organization looking into the moral and ethical principles of use of AI mm. when it comes to defense and security, that's big. So I'm just trying to say that as we are very much into this Russia, mm. uh, you know, complex situation, we are not losing sight of the, of the overall picture. And we are now in the midst of consultations within the alliance on the concept. We are also talking to our partners. We are talking to them. And my expectation is that we'll come into a negotiation within NATO in the next uh, few months and I know that our leaders uh, in Madrid will adopt a compressed, succinct, highly strategic, forward-looking new strategic concept. And that's another proof of the perennial DNA of adaptation that we have in NATO. And this is probably the most consequential transformation in world affairs, I would say, not only since the Cold War, but probably from half a millennia, if you add China to the mm. menu. This is the most significant change in global affairs in Europe for the last 30 years, but for the world, since China decided half a millennia ago to withdraw, and now they're coming back into the world affair. So we have to respond to that challenge as well. 
Minister, uh, NATO is certainly more than uh, Russia. Mm. It has uh, uh, different uh, processes ongoing. And you mentioned in your speech that emerging and destructive technologies in the hands of our adversaries might it be the great powers, China and Russia, would be devastating, and that Norway is eager to invest in new technology. Mm. Is this something that we can are playing into the alliance, or is it in order to take care of our, in the Washington Treaty, Article 3, that we are ready and have ready forces by our own? First of all, it is for our national defense, and I, I think new technologies will play an even more important role in the future. Space will definitely play a more important role. Um, hybrid threats. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, disruptive uh, technologies will come. But, but I would also like to comment on the um, strategic uh, partnership with, with Russia. Uh, actually, I, I, sh I should hope it was possible to say that Russia should be a strategic partner also in the new... Uh, in the new uh, strategic concept for NATO, but I, I'm afraid it is too soon. Um, and it's absolutely in Norway's interest to have a good dialogue, cooperation, doing business with Russia, as we have been trying to build up for, for decades. It's, it's, we are neighbors in, in, mm. in the high north. We are sharing important resources in the high north. And, and, and I think um, in the long term, we have to try to come back to the situation we had where we mm. hopefully also can see Russia as a strategic partner, mm. but it's unfortunately not the time for it now. It takes two to tango. It does. Uh, I think uh, I will open uh, the floor for some questions. You will be provided with a microphone and we will uh, disinfect it uh, afterwards in between the speakers due to the pandemic is still uh, with us. I have a question from uh, Arne Bordalhaug. If you raise up, uh, my guy will see who you are. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Kat. I'm happy that I'm not also being disinfected, just the microphone. <laughs> so uh, first uh, to the panel, thanks a lot for uh, really great, interesting um, interventions. And um, I probably guess that my question will mainly go to the Deputy Secretary General. And um, diplomacy, um, I read you that uh, in many ways, uh, the response that came from NATO, and that was leaked in uh, LPI on Wednesday, basically we are talking about re-establishing what was after the Helsinki Accords, and of course all the other documents uh, that came later. So uh, there are lots of models out there how to deal with Russia. And in a way, um, I read it that NATO is trying to bring Russia back into what we had in the 90s and early 2000s, because that was the time of the strategic partnership. But, of course, things have changed. So also I noticed, and if you can elaborate on that, the wording about Ukraine that was leaked in uh, El Pai that uh, NATO offered, I think it was to refrain from uh, ground-launched missiles, combat forces in Ukraine that it was offered. I mean, if you could confirm that the thinking is correctly uh, described in uh, this leakage, it would be of great interest, of course. And also, those words remind me about uh, the Foundation Act in Section 4, about new members to NATO, about some uh, restrictions on nuclear weapons and also on the combat forces. So, um, if I can invite you to elaborate on that, I would highly appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. I think we collect a couple of questions, uh, if that's okay uh, for you. Uh, yes, just in front of you. Thank and if you, you could uh, say your names and your affiliation, please. Uh, the former was uh, General uh, Arnebord Dalhoek, has spent three years in uh, Eastern uh, Ukraine after um, retiring. My name from is Orgun Skagestad. I am an old age pensioner and independent analyst. Um, our foreign, our Minister of Defence assured us that Norway has 
and indeed is still strengthening its uh, readiness, preparedness in the high north, inter alia by holding joint exercises, uh, NATO exercises. And I'm sure, quite sure that this is uh, very reassuring for most of us. At the same time, however, there has been a noticeable, uh, let's say, de uh, undeployment of air forces in the north. I'm uh, talking about the, the uh, phasing out of the F-16 fighter planes and the, uh, the deployment of the F-36 uh, planes to the south of Norway, mainly, and the decommissioning of the Andøya Air Base. Uh, I'm quite sure this has been noticed with some concern in NATO and among our NATO allies, and I'd like to hear if uh, this is something which has been discussed or, or which has been uh, noticed uh, as a, something that should be discussed among NATO partners. Thank you. Are your question mainly to the minister or DSG? The minister. Okay, I think we, it was uh, questions with uh, rather many details here, so maybe we start with the first one. On the board has also been a mail rep in NATO. <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, uh, we did not leak uh, our written proposal to El País, <laughs> so it was not us. <laughs> um, who was it? Or him? We don't know, but it was not us. <laughs> Um, listen, if you look to, uh, speaking of the unity of the West, we have seen, I would say, an unprecedented involvement by our uh, U.S. allies in everything which comes through this difficult situation. The level of, of uh, information sharing, the level of briefings. Wendy Sherman, the Deputy uh, Secretary of State of the U.S., the first thing she did after Geneva meeting with, with Lavrov, she came to brief allies. She even sat in the U.S. chair, the NATO-Russia Council, just to make sure there is no daylight between allies. So there is a U.S.-Russia track that U.S. has responded also in a written form. And in the last phone conversation between uh, Tony Blinken and Sergei Lavrov, the U.S. also said, listen, give us your response to the written proposals. Then is the NATO written proposals to Russia that we are awaiting the, the response to. The Secretary General of NATO is the, also the chair of the NATO-Russia Council. So that's a 31 nations thing. And Russia is sitting at the NATO-Russia Council between Romania and Slovakia, <coughs> alphabetically. And that is the OSCE track, where now we have the Polish chairman, chairpersonship, chair in office of the OSC. I've done 20 years ago as Romanian foreign minister, I was chairman in office of the OSC. So that's a very important body that if Russia would like to use for confidence building measures, for exercises, this is also a role for the OSC to play. And we are encouraging that as we speak. So the answer, I have to say, on our side, bilateral US-Russia, NATO Russia Council and the OSC from our side is quite integrated. And I cannot get into details of this, but there is an indication of which of the topics that we propose together to Russia, which will be the institution that will deal with those. You know that there is the strategic stability dialogue between Russia and, and Russian Federation and the United States that is more than the current crisis. It's about nuclear stability. It's a lot, lot of things that are parallel between two big nuclear powers. Also, cyber is part of the parallel uh, uh, US-Russia track. NATO, what I can say, we didn't leak the document, but the document is accurate. So what we say in public is exactly what we say in writing. No compromising on principles of sovereignty of nations in Europe. This will never be able to compromise. Is like saying that we are basically giving a veto to a third party to the freedom of choice of any European nation. This is something unthinkable. We'll never do that. But other things we can do. And of course, again, in the OAC, and uh, at my level and also the SecGen's level, uh, we are also coordinating with the US, with the EU, with the OSCE and NATO. 
uh, almost weekly, I think, Dragos, uh, my colleague here, is my, he's my boss, uh, other than Jens and my wife. Uh, <laughs> um, so we are doing this systematically just to make sure that we give to Russia not only a united front, but options for them. A broad strategic menu to choose from and not to find an excuse for them to, uh, to backpedal uh, from a military uh, incursion or occupation or invasion of, 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 uh, of Ukraine, but also because we want predictable security arrangements in Europe. And this is something that we are really trying to do. So that's where we are. And this will be consistent also down the road and see. As we like to say, uh, the ball is in Russia's court. Mm. Well, all balls are in Russia's court now, and we see if they want to play tennis or not. <laughs> Minister, we have this question about the high north. Yeah, um, it is um, an important part of the, uh, of the political platform of the government to strengthen the armed forces, um, continue to do so. And, and especially in, in the high north or in, in the northern part of Norway. Um, but it, but it, we, we are investing heavily in new capabilities at the, at the time being, and it is uh, a fact that uh, we have a dip in between. We are uh, uh, changing from F-16 to F-35, which means that we uh, have lower capacity at the moment. Um, we are also changing from P3 to P8, um, from P3 Orion to, um, to um, P8. That gives the same situation, so it, it is unfortunately a fact, but uh, at the same time there is no other way to do it, we can, we, we can, because we cannot double uh, our resources. We have, we have limited resources and limited human resources available, so it has to be a dip uh, in between. But we are building up as fast as possible. And, and w well, I, I'm not sure I'm sh if I should comment on uh, the on the Evans situation, but uh, I think everyone here knows that I do not think it was the wisest decision to, to move from on to Evans, but uh, the parliament has decided to do so. And I guess that will not be a part of NATO's new strategic concept. It will <laughs> not. <laughs> okay, I will open for uh, some more questions. Uh, Halvorsjön, I saw your hand. Thank you, uh, Kate, thank you for arranging this meeting and thank you for your interventions, all of you. Um, uh, forgive me to take a step backwards because I want to talk about the most important thing in every modern society and that is energy. And through the last years, we have begun this so-called green shift, which has made Europe more dependent on Russian energy than we used to be. And this is, of course, if you look into, well, every country looks into their bank account, and the Germans are looking into their bank account and their energy account, and they see their dependency on Russia. Uh, and I think really to have an effective diplomacy uh, through the whole of history, you have to have two things. You have to have a carrot and a stick. Uh, we see NATO tries to use the carrot, but the stick is not effective because of the German dependency on Russian gas. So uh, the question is, uh, will NATO or the whole Western community try to do something about this, to, do, uh, to make Europe more independent of Russian energy. And to uh, the Norwegian ministry, it's not his portfolio, I know, but uh, his uh, party is engaged in this. Will Norway uh, start a program to develop more gas fields to deliver more, uh, uh, more energy to Europe and to make Europe more uh, independent of Russian gas. That would be a real important strategical task. And is the Norwegian government, ha have you considered this and thought about this? Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I will allow one more question, but I think that <laughs> Norway is producing uh, as much as they can at the moment, I guess. But we will come back to that. Um, one question down there. Yeah? You will get a microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting conversations. Uh, uh, conversation. I am ambassador of Croatia here in uh, Norway. 
also former ambassador to Romania and Moldova. So, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, I would like just to add uh, a thing, uh, situation, a little bit uh, to situation in southeastern Europe, uh, because we also feel a strong pressure last, let's say, ten years in southeastern Europe and uh, uh, creeping influences of uh, Russia, also a little bit of China and Turkey, may, if I may say so, a little bit. <laughs> and uh, also um, we feel the leverage of Russian influence in countries like uh, Serbia, Bosnia, Montenegro, as a NATO member state, also not to forget. So uh, just if someone wants to comment on this as well, not to forget South, Southern Plank. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, we are not going to forget South. NATO is, uh, have, shall have a deterrence 360 degrees that also include uh, the South. We have five minutes left, and I will uh, <laughs> ask uh, the panel uh, to uh, um, conclude. But first, you had one question, and you had one direct question, and then we will take the whole panel in. Energy security. Can Norway provide more natural gas to Europe, or should the Germans have nuclear power? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really a big question. And and, and as you in, when you introduced me, you said that I have also been the Minister of Petroleum and Energy. So yeah. <laughs> this is um, attempting to go into this discussion. And of course, the energy situation in in Europe and the dependency on Russian gas is really a challenge for for Europe. It is, but. I mean, there is a lot happening on, on, uh, on renewable energy in uh, Germany and in most of the European countries, wind power, solar power. Uh, solar, solar power. Uh, Norway is producing as much gas as we can at the moment. And if we should supply more, we have to find gas first. And that is uh, more and more a challenge to do so uh, on the Norwegian continental sh shelf. But, we have no intention to stop producing gas in uh, Norway. Uh, quite contrary, we will continue to, to, to develop uh, the Norwegian energy also on wind power, uh, which is a huge debate at the moment. But Europe should probably diversify its energy mixes. Absolutely. But that's not up to NATO to decide, is it, ESG? Uh, directly not, but uh, in terms of energy security, we are very much uh, attentive to this issue because it has been weaponized. Energy has been weaponized by Russia. That's an obvious thing. Mm. So just I think last week we had a very interesting briefing uh, to the North Atlantic Council by four uh, relevant stakeholders in energy. The commissioner from Estonia for energy from the EU. We had a new head of the, uh, I think IRENI is the acronym of this renewable agency on energy renewable agency based in, in Abu Dhabi. We had uh, Amos Huckstein, the Special Envoy on Energy at the State Department. And also we had uh, the head of the uh, International Energy uh, 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 Association. So what I, speaking of what the interlocutors have mentioned, uh, of course there are specific economic and political situations in countries. Not everyone has the the abundance of Norwegian resources. My country, Romania, has in the Black Sea offshore natural gas, and it is the intention to do this. Uh, the taxonomy of the European uh, Commission is allowing, it seems, uh, gas and nuclear to be considered as transition. We see now liquefied gas coming from Qatar and America in many uh, LNG terminals, including in Croatia, uh, dear Madam Ambassador, including in Greece, including in Poland, uh, there is discussion now about pipelines connecting Spain that received from uh, Algeria lots of gas to France. So what I'm just what I'm trying to say that the way in which Russia is abusing of its energy exports to Europe, will, every country will learn the lessons from this. All of us will diversify. All of us will find the right mix. And to be honest, I don't have a problem for Russian gas to be in the mix. No. It's business. It's also business. Mm but not to be at a level that it be transformed into a monopoly or weaponized. Mm. And I think Europe is going the right direction. 
and NATO is helping with our strategic assessment, while decisions, of course, have to be made in capitals and, of course, in the European Union and in other places. So I think Russia is getting exactly the opposite of what they want. Mm. And about the South? Yeah. Do you have about a South. couple of words about the South? Western Balkans, the situation in Libya, the situation in Syria, <coughs> the situation in nagorno karabakh the situation in Mali, the situation in Central African Republic, the situation in Venezuela, where we see increased Russian activities and Hezbollah activities. That's why we'll get, I hope soon, the newest of NATO's partners as nation will be Ghana. This will be the first sub-Saharian mm. partner of NATO. Why? Because they are concerned about the risk of spillover of terrorism from the Sahel to the Gulf of Guinea. Today, the Gulf of Guinea is the place with 80% of maritime piracy in the world is happening as we speak. So Colombia and Ghana are working with us. And of course, we'll see how allies uh, would, would like to, to have NATO play a bigger role in the South. But I'm telling you, not only because the summit is in Madrid, <laughs> uh, and will be a southern dimension uh, just by <laughs> geography. By the way, Lithuania will be hosting the 2023 NATO summit. So watch out for that one. <laughs> Um, but the southern part, the northern part, uh, and the other parts are for us, I don't say equally important, but they are part of the same integrated view of, of, of security and, and global affairs mm. in NATO. So I want to send a single re reassurance that uh, we are on top of our game and will deliver, a, I think, an exceptionally crisp and forward-looking strategic concept in Madrid. Thank you very much. Uh, time is running out, but I give you one minute each. And what will be the most important issue and topic to handle in the Madrid summit or on the way to the Madrid summit in your uh, eyes, Svarja? Start with you. <coughs> well, yes. Uh, first, I don't think that uh, this strategic concept will be so very interesting because what always <laughs> happens is that NATO changes its policy, and then afterwards they change their concept. That <laughs> happened in 20, 2010, and that will happen now. And look at China, look at Russia. The language on, on, on China and, and language on Russia will be interesting, of course, especially about uh, Russia now. But, but the policies on China and, and, and Russia has changed already. Um, I think one of the, the very important things is how to um, how the, the debate on China will go on, because already there is a lot of misunderstanding on China. Uh, in the debate, in, in, in uh, public debate, it looks like NATO is going to into Pacific, into Asia, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's 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 about how to strengthen. Uh, the resilience in, in Europe, how to fight China in Europe. That, uh, it's, it's about uh, how the Allies is doing their homework in mm. Europe. Yeah. Mm. Uh, that is a very important point. Uh, I think NATO should think of. Thank you. And probably in cyberspace and probably in the Middle East and Africa. Yeah, uh, I'm very grateful to, to the Deputy Secretary General for bringing to our attention again that the strategic concept is about a lot more than the relationship with Russia, particularly technology and the race for space, mm. uh, the quantum uh, race, where Russia is in a very weak position in a lot of these areas. Now, I believe that going forward, Russia will use precisely the areas where it has leverage in order to carve out a space. And I think going forward, energy will be on top of the agenda for, for the Russians, migration and stability to the south, and the nuclear deal with the US, where Russia is instrumental in order to bring that mm. into a closure and prevent a major war mm. in the Middle East. Russia also has the key to that process, and it will happen over the past, or the, over the next half a year, precisely when we are discussing these things. Thank you, Cecilia. There's a lot of topics that we didn't touch upon, Kashin, but the main issue, how do you see it in the path on, to Madrid? And the main issue, imagine, if the current crisis happened during the previous presidency of the United States, uh. that would be challenging. I think 
perhaps the most important role of the strategic concept is to contribute to keep United States in to keep the United States engaged in, in NATO, to, to, to tie it up a little bit even further, um, so that when we get the next Republican president, might be in a few years' time, uh, might not be the same, might be, uh, but might be the same as well, uh, that we don't, you don't slide out into crisis. So my, 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 <laughs> my hope will be that the, the strategic concept can contribute to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our guest from NATO headquarters, Mishwa, and our minister, our panel, and the audience for sharing your remarks, posing questions, and engaging in a free and open discussion, which are the backbone of our democracy and individual right to freely express our views. The Atlantic Committee are here to secure you this free platform of interaction. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and so me platforms. And if you are interested in a tough debate, please tune in to our website this afternoon at 17 p.m. Central European time or 11 a.m. Eastern Eastern Time to hear two distinguished speakers, Professor John Mersheimer and Dr. Stephen Wertheim, in a digital discussion on America's future role in European security in the era of great power competition. It will be moderated by Asle Toya, the member of the Nobel uh, Committee. But thank you very much to my panel here. Thank you for coming up from Brussels. It's been so nice to have you here in Oslo. And thank you, uh, Minister. It's the first time you have visited the Atlantic yes. Committee. Yes. Thank you. And it will not be the last, I hope. <laughs> okay, goodbye.